awesome to welcome Ben McCollum to share the game with us. Coach McCollum's success at Missouri Northwest has been ridiculously impressive. He is a four-time NABC Division II National Coach of the Year and a three-time National Championship Coach. Over the past five seasons, McCollum has guided Northwest to a mark of 159-8 and eight, and three NCAA Division II National Championships. Over the past three seasons, Northwest has gone 97-3. and three. McCollum has guided the Bearcats to eight straight MIAA regular season titles and five consecutive MIAA tournament crowns. In 12 seasons at Northwest, McCollum has an overall record of 300 wins and 78 losses. Coach McCollum, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot for having me. Well, super excited to talk to you. I mean, your level of success is crazy. And uh, maybe let's start with that. How do you stay so motivated with all the success you've had? You know, for, for us, we've always focused so much on the process. And I know it sounds kind of cliche, but after the 2017 season, when we won our first national championship, you get done and you get the trophy and everybody's excited. And as a head coach, you sit there and it's like, boy, this is this is what it feels like. It, it doesn't feel as euphoric as you would have expected. And so you realize that all the different struggles and all the things building up to that and the memories that you create with the kids that you have um, is, is, is what makes coaching so much fun. And so um, it's easy for me to be motivated on a daily basis because my job is ultimately to make a difference on these kids' lives and, and to make them successful once they leave our school. And so daily to get them to push past the point that, that they that they think they can go or, or um, making sure to hold them accountable, keeping them consistent, um, all those different things, handling adversity, teaching those things so that once they leave Northwest Missouri State, um, they're much better off and they can be successful. So it, it allows for that, that motivation. I think the other side of that is I'm very naturally competitive. And so I, I just, I, I like to win and um, I've been fascinated with dominant programs, dominant teams where a lot of people would hate uh, the Yankees when they were so good or they'd hate on different programs. I study them and I am incredibly fascinated by how people can maintain success. Well, and no doubt I was going to ask you about being competitive because uh, I would imagine you're a re relentless competitor and I imagine that's what you foster within your program. So I'm wondering if you can give some insights in terms of how you develop the competitiveness within your program. I think it just, it, it feeds people when you're naturally competitive and, and you naturally want to win everything that you do and you naturally have a little bit of edge to you. I think it just feeds everybody else in your program. I don't think there's any drills or, or anything specific that you can do to impact somebody's competitiveness necessarily. I think it's just something um, they see how competitive I am. They see how competitive our staff is and, and they naturally get that way. Um, obviously in the recruiting process, we, we evaluate that and, and make sure that a kid has that in him. Um, but ultimately, as long as I infect them with my personal energy and, and my coach and my assistant coaches infect them, I think I think the comp competitiveness will come out. Well, it shines through in your success and the success of your players and uh, particularly the development of your players within your program. Uh, players develop from year one to year four or year five, depending on whether they redshirted. I got to think player development has been a huge part of what you do, especially it seems from the point guard play perspective. It is. I think that, you know, a lot of people use player development kind of in a, I don't know, cliche way, like our, you know, everybody is like, what's your player development? What's that? You know, I think it's one of the more overrated and overused terms there is. What I found is uh, player development is, is really about developing the strengths that they currently have and making them better and better at those current strengths and getting them to, to love themselves and love what they're naturally great at. Obviously, you consistently work on their weaknesses and things of that nature. But once they hit the point where they play for me, where they're, you know, 18 to 22, 23 year olds, a lot of the strengths are kind of ingrained into them. And then you just, hey, this is what you're great at. Let's just keep doing that. Um, from a defensive perspective, 
I do think you can move your feet a little bit better. So we do improve that. We keep things very simple defensively. Um, from an offensive perspective, the ability to stop, the ability to pivot, the ability to change pace, um, screening angles, that sort of thing. We do develop those things. But as far as like doing a ball handling move, a variety of different ways, making a non-shooter a shooter, um, those things, that it just doesn't happen. You're just not going to have that happen. So um, we just try to teach guys how to play and, and then get them to play to their strengths consistently. And naturally, you see guys blossom in our program because of the confidence that, that they get from that. Well, two things stand out there, and, and it's, it's a great perspective. And the thing that you said about getting them to love their strengths or themselves in that sense what are some ways that you do that? Do you just notice that they're good at it and then keep pointing it out to them and then how it's successful or what are we doing to be able to help them? Yeah. So, so when we come in, like, like even right now, so we've been able to practice for like a week and a half, two weeks. And all we've done is play essentially pickup and it's fairly organized pickup and we haven't really coached anything. We haven't done any drills. We just come in and, we warm up and then we then we play and we try to identify what kids naturally do and where they naturally move and what they are naturally great at. And once we identify that, then we try to build our offense around their natural strengths to get them to love their strengths and, and kind of love themselves is really just about encouragement and, and showing them how they fit and what they're great at. Um, and getting them, like we've said um, over and over, is, is getting them um, great at more and, I guess, good at less. And so um, as long as you can get, get that buy-in and get those kids to understand those things and, and how they're valuable to our program, uh, a lot of times kids naturally improve. And, and, and from the outside, it looks like we've just drastically improved their player development, when in reality, they're just doing less of the things that they do poorly. And, and, and the things that they do great, they do it all the time. So for instance, if I have a shooter and he gets a paint touch three and he, and he turns it down and doesn't shoot it, those are the times I will absolutely lose my mind. And it'll be like, hey, you know, we're here to shoot. We want you to shoot constantly. And obviously it'll be a little bit more colorful than that. But, um, but we try to encourage that, like shoot it. If you're a shooter, shoot it all the time. If you're a cutter, cut all the time, do it great. If you're a driver, drive all the time offensive rebounder, whatever, whatever you're great at, let's do that and, and, and show them how valuable they are to your program. And, and I think that goes a long ways for kids. Oh, I love that perspective. And uh, you talked about like shooting it and a big part of your offense is obviously shooting the three or scoring at the rim and essentially no mid range. If we look at some of your shooting charts for a season, it's pretty remarkable how you remove the mid range. So I'm curious how you coach that and what you emphasize in that process. Yeah, I think the first part is I'm not anti-mid-range. So, um, you know, a lot of people, when they go into it, they're no mid-range, no mid-range, no mid-range. We really don't say that. Uh, what we're trying to get is, is layups, free throws, and, and uh, paint touch threes. I mean, that's, that's kind of the consistent deal. But what we try to do is not work backwards, per se. So a lot of analytics and our analytics, I think, are off the charts. I'm not necessarily an analytics person unless I'm just trying to prove a point. And so then I use objective measures to be able to prove a point. Um, but we work in, you know, our objective is to get the best shot we can possibly get, which would be obviously a layup. And so um, if I'm going to get a layup, I have to be able to space the floor. Well, the best way to, to space the floor is to shoot threes and be able to stretch you out as far as possible because it's worth more than a than a mid-range two and so <clears throat> with that if I'm attacking the paint trying to get layups naturally you're going to get free throws within that but again in order to get those free throws you have to space the floor by shooting threes whereas what a lot of coaches do I found is hey the analytics say I need to shoot a lot of threes because they're worth more than twos and so they go into games and they shoot okay we need to shoot 25 threes this game. Well, maybe they're taking away the three. So maybe I'll shoot five threes this game and I'll shoot, you know, free throws and layups the entire game. And, and so we try not to work with an analytics mind necessarily. We try to work with, okay, we're trying to get layups. If I can't get a layup, that means somebody either fouled me or they helped. If they help, 
why wouldn't I drive and kick and try to get a better shot for a three point shot or a shot fake drive and reattack and get myself free for a different layup? Whereas the mid range, the people that are excited about mid range, a lot of times they're taking contested mid range shots because somebody comes in and helps. Well, at that point, pass the ball um, is just our theory. And so at the college level, I just don't feel like you need to do that. Um, plus, you see a lot of the pros that'll take mid range, you know, like Chris Paul in the thing and Kawhi Leonard. And it's like, okay, well, I don't, Kawhi Leonard, he hasn't walked into my gym yet. So, um, yeah, Kawhi Leonard can take whatever shot he wants if he plays for me. So, <laughs> long, long explanation on that. But yeah, so I, you know, a lot of the people that I'm not anti mid range, I still think, I still think it has value. Um, it's just for our level, we just don't need to take them. Yeah, it's very logical how you explain it. And I love that logic to it. Now, I know we've got to get into offense because I know so many people have curious questions about what you do offensively. But I'd like to start from the defensive side where, if anything, because of how good you are on offense, you're underrated defensively. But uh, one thing I want to ask is because you hunt matchups relentlessly on offense, it appears, does that dictate how you defend as well in terms of you approach the defensive scout, the defensive focus? in taking away matchups for the opponent? I would say, I would say, yes. I would say our matchups, we have a specific coach that literally matches our guys up based on their strengths in defending. So, you know, if, if we've got one guy that's great at guarding drivers then we'll try to keep them consistently on a driver or a guy that's good at guarding shooters, we'll consistently have them on those. Um, so we certainly do, do that matchup wise. We'll certainly have different ball screen coverages for, for different people. Um, but we don't change a lot defensively outside of just basic scout things where um, if a guy likes to go left, we might shade his, his left hand and, and get him to go right, you know, or, or um, just really simplistic things that we try to take away um, throughout a scout. And, and um, so, yeah, it is, it is somewhat personnel driven uh, per opponent. And, and then we're able to do that and, make a lot of little simple subtle changes that you don't realize we're making because we keep everything the same so our whole part our whole uh, piece of our defense won't ever change the parts will constantly change based on who we play um, and how we're going to defend that game so whereas you know the, the difference would be okay let's say we're, we're a gap defensive team. Okay, well, the gap defense isn't working. Well, let's switch to a zone or let's switch to no middle or let's switch to more of a pack line or let's switch to this. We're not gonna change our defense. We're just gonna adjust the little pieces and parts of it um, to fit who we're playing. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, you, com coming back to the offensive side, you talked about scoring at the rim and a huge part of your offense is obviously cutting. And uh, this process of cutting off the ball, whether it's off the ball screen or off the drives, so I'm curious then how you teach that. Is it a read or is it a rule? What are the emphasis in terms of teaching this? It, it boils down to this. And I've, I've had a lot of people ask me this, this question and then they get really frustrated with my answer. Um, <laughs> we always say anything on offense, the defense will tell you what to do. And so with cutting, it's if your guy looks at the ball, then cut. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. And so, well, okay, so what if the ball's on the right wing and I'm in the left corner and it seems like you get that cut a lot? Well, yeah, we probably get that cut a lot, absolutely. But that's because the defender turned his head. I mean, it's, 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 it's very simplistic in, in our approach with it. What happened when we started it was we were having trouble because we shoot the three so well. And then we also had a, a really good guard named Justin Pitts at the time, and he was able to get paint and get, get a lot of layups. And so what teams started doing was uh, what I call dorking somebody, or they just wouldn't guard some of our guys that were, you know, lower percentage shooters. And then those lower percentage shooters would, would still shoot it consistently. And it would be like, okay, you know, for a whole game, that's not what we really want. We still want our best shooters to shoot as many shots as we can. But the problem is, is we have to somehow create space. But no matter what we did, no matter how many shots they would make, it didn't matter. They still wouldn't guard, you know, the two, the two players on the floor because they wanted to shoot the floor on everybody else. So we, we started to think, how can we create space on the floor um, 
while having guys that they dork or don't guard. And, and we just started paying attention to a lot of different teams and, and like, okay, that cut, that created a huge gap. Okay, that, that cut, that created space on the floor. And what we found was it's actually better to cut to create space than, than shoot. And, and as you cut, you actually clear more space for layups. Um, but the issue with cutting is if, if you don't have shooting with the cutting, cutting does you no good. And so you have to have a good balance of shooting and cutting. Because if you have five shooters on the floor and no one chooses to cut, it's really not very good spacing because four can guard five. So everybody calls this five out offense, which I don't think is very good spacing. But if you have a guy that cuts or even two guys that cut with the shooting, it creates more space. So that's how we kind of came about was we were trying to create space when people weren't guarding. And, and that, I guess leads me to my next thing and then I'll get to your question. But, uh, but with, um, with the, the, the spacing, pe people talk about spacing. And when they talk about spacing, they say, um, well, we want to space the floor and really spread out. And we want to have X's and spots on the floor. Well, if you're not guarded, the whole point about space is creating openings on the floor. If you're not being guarded and that your defender is in the lane, you have not created space no matter how far you are out there. And so we want to space the level of the defense. So cutting allows for that. So if I start to cut you, now you have to defend that cut because I'm going to get a layup. I'm going to make it, right? Well, if I've got a guy that makes every single kick out three and he's not being guarded, that still creates space because we're going to make that shot more consistently, if that makes any sense. Totally. So there's two options. They can cut, obviously, when they read that their defender loses vision to the ball, and then they can cut if they're not being guarded, if they're being, you know, into your term, dork. <laughs> it's a great term. Yeah, I got that. I got that from a guy named Brad Bigler. He called it dorking people. So at, at, I don't know where he got it, but Love um, it. yeah, it's whatever. <laughs> it's brilliant. And then uh, with that part of it, do you, do you ever feel like the cut gets in the way because you're a heavy ball screen team uh, in the way of the roll or how does the roller fit into this cutting philosophy? Yeah, we don't roll a lot. And, right. and, and I, I don't, I don't think it would with a roll team either because either way you're washing your defender through. So everybody gets concerned. Like what if I cut where that guy's driving? Well, that's fine because that defender still has to go with that cutter. And, and if he doesn't, then the cutter just circles back around and we get ourselves a layup or we get ourselves a paint touch when we pass it to the cutter, which is just as good um, as, as a layup off of that. Because, you, you know, as long as you touch paint somehow, some way, um, you know, then you're able to, to manipulate the defense and, and whatnot. So uh, we, we don't have any trouble with, with that. Again, we don't roll a ton. Uh, we roll some, um, you know, just to make sure that we break it up and against certain teams will we'll roll a lot. Um, but for the most part, we're, we're, we're popping. And then there's there any automatic on a pick and pop for a cutter to go to create space for the pick and pop? Or is that just, again, a decision or a read? That's a read based on, based on how we're being defended, based on tags, based on um, who's defending the ball screen you know, based on who's coming off, who's popping, et cetera, et cetera. And then how everybody else is spaced um, accordingly. And then one cutter at a time. So first cutters, right. And then everyone plays off of that cut. No, uh, whenever they want to cut, they can cut. Okay. Yep. So you can have multiple cutters. Yeah. You can have two at a time. I mean, we had our first national title team. Sometimes we'd have three guys just cutting all at the same time. And it, it never really impacted anything. It actually created space and, um, so yeah, we, we, we've never really gotten overly concerned or overly detailed because what I found is right when you put a rule in, then the defense catches up and they scout you and, and then you have to put another rule in or, or you have to create another cut per se. And so we want everything to be very read based. Um, we want guys to make to decisions for themselves based on our teaching and, and we want to have to coach less throughout the season essentially we want to teach more early on and, and coach less um, late in the season so when, when you see us late in the season uh, there's very little coaching that goes on there's a lot of teaching and a lot of scouting and 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 a lot of helping them um, give them information so they can make the decisions but there's not a lot of okay if this then this that that's that's 
to me, that's more like a football mentality. If they do this, then this is your read. For us, it's, you know, every read is completely different. Every team's different. We got to give you the information that's, so that you can make the best decision for yourself when you're on the floor. Yeah, it's great stuff to be able to understand and to be able to dive deeper with you on. And then the other part that it all comes back to is then how are you developing this? You mentioned already playing pickup. I imagine a lot of this has to be developed offense versus defense. Yeah, play a lot. We play a lot and and um, we'll watch some film, um, quite a bit of film with like individual people. I watch a ton of film. Um, you know, my guys we don't just go in and, and like a lot of people are, Hey, you need to watch film after every practice and, and do that sort of thing. I'm not that way. If I can show you two clips, I can, I, that's all I need. I just show you two clips, five minutes and you're tuned in and that's it. And so we, we show less is more with, with film. Um, but a lot of those less is more um, type of clips to, to be able to help them make decisions for themselves and teach them. You mentioned, uh, the pick and pop as, as an emphasis, but then you also ghost a lot of screens. So I'm curious then again, how are you developing that concept, the difference between setting it and ghosting it? Yeah. So, so it kind of goes with that, that defensive principle. We'd rather make one screen work. So um, if it's, let's just say, let's just say it's a, let's just say it's a side ball screen. Um, if we're going to a side ball screen and somebody switches, well, then you have to you have to change the side ball screen. You don't change the whole play. You don't just run a different play. You don't just now, okay, so now we're going to be a screen screener team, or now we're going to be a stagger team, or now we're going to be a swing team, or now we're going to be – no, we're still going to run the side ball. We're just going to run it a little differently. And so how it's evolved over time is somebody's taken something away. Um, so let's just say they're switching one game. And – and, and so now you have to somehow be able to still get open. Well, there's different levels to switch. There's different depth, different people switching. And so then you have to adjust that same exact side ball screen and get something out of it rather than changing your entire offense. And so over time, we've evolved into setting a side ball screen 25 different ways. Um, it's all real subtle and it all really looks the same. And your next question might be, well, how do you define those? We don't. <laughs> um, it's 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 per team. You know, it's it's if I'm playing a no middle team, then you have to adjust to the side ice, which they're going to probably side ice and then switch. And then what's the level of their switch? Who are they switching with? How do they take away from the ball? How do they space away from the ball? And then you create that same side ball screen. So we complicate the little simple side ball screen and, and, and eventually you end up with a different type of screen and and so then over time it's just evolved the benefit for us and and our level is um now i've you know had the good fortune of being able to ask higher level coaches and, and different coaches um and pick their brains but when we first started we, we didn't have access to to be able to pick people's brains like i couldn't just call an nba coach i couldn't just call a high major coach and or a mid-major or low major even for that matter um so we we kind of tried to do it all just watching film and, and kind of adjusting the same things that we do um, and, and then just take things that we liked based on other people's film or what, what when we've gotten something taken away, okay, so we've got this taken away, how can we make that work? There's an overreaction somewhere. How can we now make this work? And, and that's kind of how our offense has evolved. And I imagine the next question, I know the answer based on what you've just answered so far, but uh, I have to ask, because you guys do a great job flipping screens, you know, late pivots, whatever you want to call them, that the ball screen comes to one side, but then you're actually going to set it on the other side. I imagine, again, this is a read, this is a decision by the screener. Yes, 100% a read. Yep, yep, 100% a read. Obviously, early on with freshmen and stuff like that, you might have to identify some of the reads and, and simplify it and, and maybe even tell them, Hey, make sure you flip this one. Um, but yeah, we, those are all reads. Those are all the kids just deciding based on what they see. So is there something that within kind of your game plan for games or your approach to developing this in practice with all these things, ghosting, pick and pop, um, obviously the late pivots, is this something that you just want variability from your players rather than doing the same thing all the time as well? 
Absolutely. I think random offense is really hard to scout. And so we want to make it as random as we can possibly make it. I've always thought um, that you want to be able to beat the best teams. Like it's great to beat the 10th place team. I want to beat the first place team. And so what's the best way to be able to beat first place? And, and there's a variety of things to do, but going back to the offense is the less scoutable you are and the more you enable and empower your players that have natural abilities and natural gifts, um, the more difficult you're going to be to play against. And, and you can now, you know, allow yourself to beat the best. Cause if I play, you know, some of the teams in our conference that are towards the top, they're just going to take away anything that, that is a set, like they're just going to take it away. And, and so you have to be able to adjust on the fly without always having to call a different play. And so that's where your kids are able to do that. But yeah, in practice, um, yeah, they just kind of figure it out. And obviously we teach them and we've shown them stuff and, and we give them all the information. So they know, okay, they're probably going to defend it like this. Um, this guy will probably be on you. Um, here's the defense away. And then we'll work on stuff like that. And, and, and so they'll, they'll know, you know, five or six different types of things that they can do. And then they just have to figure it out for themselves. Going with all of this, then another big part of cutting and spacing and all the different things that you guys do. I'm wondering, what is your philosophy on the cutter emptying? Where do you want them to go? What do you want them to do? Again, is this a read or what are you emphasizing? Yeah, again, yeah, it's a read. It, it really depends on on what the defense tells them to do, um, <laughs> unfortunately. So, so they can post up or they can get out. Uh, yeah, they can post up if they want. It just depends on if they're creating space or not and, and if they can actually post up. So if they can't post up, no, let's let's keep clearing and, and, and let's cut. But a lot of times our cuts work. Um, so they might cut to create space. They might cut to get the ball and then make a decision off of that because we got paint. They might cut to score. It just, it just, there's so many things you can do off of cutting. So, um, you know, the, the one thing that you don't want to do is sit in that 15 foot range. After you do cut, you want to clear space a little bit more. Um, the only people we'll have, like we had a player, it would have been six, seven years ago where we would actually space him to 15 feet. And so his drive and kick would be a 15 footer. It would be a mid range. And so that's why I, I know I'm not anti mid range. He just created space with his mid range and he shot it at about a 75% clip. So if he cut, he may just space the 15. Feet. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's what the defense tells you to do. I mean, the incredible points per possession that you guys play at is, is impressive. So the part that helps that is obviously getting the free throw line, but the other part I want to get your opinion on is what are the important aspects of teaching finishing around the rim that you're emphasizing you know it, it, first off yeah finishing we work on it every day that would be one of the very few individual skills that we we work on consistently just making a layup um finishing to me is more about uh taking good shots good layups not the 50 50 layups that are real body on you know, layups, those are tough shots to make, you know, I've got probably two or three guys that can really consistently make those kind of layups. And so understanding that if you're trying to finish it at the rim, you either need to get fouled or make it. And if you don't, and they come over and help, it's, it's a drive and kick. Let's make somebody else better. And let's get ourselves a little bit better opportunity at the rim. I, I think the higher the level you go, the more difficult it becomes to, to really finish the more important it is to understand what is a 50-50 finish and what is a no doubt finish with shot blocking. And, and so making sure that when I do drive, if I'm, if I'm baiting a shot blocker, drive and kick, um, and then get yourself a little bit better opportunity, a little bit better shot to make sure that you can make that layup. So shot selection is probably more important than finishing at the rim um, for us. Yeah, the decision is more important than the skill almost. Absolutely. And that's the same for shooting is what I found is, is, you know, how do your guys shoot so well? Cause they take really good shots and, and obviously they're in the gym. Like I'll have people on the gun on the shooting machine and they'll shoot 85, 90% from three on three, 400 shots. And, and so they're elite shooters on top of it, but more importantly, they take great shots. 
Well, it comes back to what you said earlier about it's, it's not a drill. It's an emphasis. It's an important teaching part about educating them about what is good and what is not. And uh, that shines through. And I mean, this as a compliment coach. I don't get a great playbook from watching you guys. I can't draw a hundred plays. Right. But you take that as a compliment. That is a huge compliment because you guys obviously kill it with points per possession. And you do that because you emphasize these concepts and these understandings that happen. Yes. And that's, that is probably one of the best compliments that, that can be given when people say that it's like, well, that's, that's great. That's a good thing. I mean, I'm empowering my players. I'm enabling them to, to do their thing. And, and, um, you know, obviously it's, it still works. And, um, you know, so yeah, we, we love that compliment. That's what we want it to look like. That's great. Uh, elite decision-making out of ball screen as well. And uh, I'm just curious if you have any emphasis or teaching points out of the ball screen. A lot of them, um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> the, you know, the simplicity of everything that we do is probably more so. So, uh, you know, I always try to say complicate the simple things. And so, like we talked about with that screen, we can set a screen 45 different ways. So if you can complicate a simple thing, then, you know, the whole doesn't change, but the parts do. And, and it, you can change parts, but when you consistently change the whole, kids don't have confidence in what they're doing. and so. Um, with a ball screen read, it's just it's just about keeping things very, very, very simple and 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 not overcomplicating, not trying to make great plays on it. And naturally, you'll make great plays because of the simplicity of it. Uh, some dribble drive focus, uh, for lack of a better way to explain it, at the rim with your post relocation or different types of actions like that. Uh, again, is that is that accurate? That's what you're trying to do is just relocate opposite if there is a player at the rim. Uh, yeah, again, depends on the defense, but um, yeah, uh, you know, a lot of times we don't have a lot of people down there. Every once in a while, we'll have somebody in the dunker, the extended dunker. Um, very rarely do we have somebody on the block. I just think that's bad spacing at this point. And we don't have a, you know, we don't have an elite big that can just sit there and, and post up right underneath the rim. So um, yeah, we would, we would do that. We don't work on that ever. I think that just naturally happens with our cutting piece you know and and um but we don't work on relocating underneath or relocating opposite or just never really have worked on that it just makes sense right to players <laughs> to be able to yeah it just kind of makes sense based on our cutting based on yeah. you know if the defender turns his head and faces the ball you should move and and that's the same thing there so again if i if i put in a rule then that guy's going to stand in the dunker spot and every time he drives he's always going to move that direction and then eventually the defender is going to understand that and take away that angle of the pass. They're going to get into the body a little bit better and we're not going to be able to make that decision. And so, um, you know, we try to, we try to avoid like hard, fast rules with that stuff. It's more um, concepts versus precision. So you talked about uh, points per possession, getting to the rim, uh, a characteristic of a driving team, which you have, a, you have drivers off ball screen, you have drivers on catches, different things like that is obviously the off the ball spacing as well. Is there anything you're teaching shooters in terms of off the ball spacing if they're not a cutter? No, just making sure that you, you, you understand your man will give you the answer. And so um, the more you're aware of what your defender is doing, uh, the better you can create space for the ball. And so whatever that may be, um, depending upon if you're facing a pack team, a, a, a no middle team, a gap team, a zone or whatever that may be, just being very aware of, of what's going on around you. I, I don't want them aware of me. Like during the games, that, that's, that's like my thing is, is I, they're going to listen to me naturally just because I've got really good kids and coachable kids and, and whatnot. I want them to really be present in the game. And, and, and when they're so focused on what am I supposed to do, like, okay, he drove middle on this one, I'm always supposed to fade to the corner. Or, hey, he drove this way, I'm always supposed to come off a of flare. I'm always supposed to um, screen the help, whatever it may be. And they're always thinking in terms of what does coach want me to do? And, and the, the, the better we can eliminate that, uh, you know, and we don't fully eliminate that, obviously. There's, there's times that, that kids do think in terms of what does coach want me to do. Um, but the more we can eliminate that stuff, like with shooters, um, the more free of mind they play, the more confident they play, and the more they can think for themselves. 
and, and I think that just enables and empowers kids to, to be able to be more confident on the floor. That's uh, great stuff. And the other characteristic of a driving team is that they have different types of plans for when you get in trouble off the drive. And that would be one thing that you, your players often turn a drive into a post up or what's called bar, a Barkley often, or they'll continue their dribble underneath like a Nash type of move if people can mm -hmm. visualize that. So these must be things as well that you're teaching within this is what happens when the drive doesn't lead immediately to a score or to a kick out. Absolutely. You know, the, the undergoing it under control, the ability to stop is, 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 you know, very, very important. This is the ability to stop. Yeah. How can you stop yourself? How, how do you, it, you don't have to just fly in there and shoot it because you think that you have a layup. It's, it's not necessary. So, cause we can always get something better and, and maintaining that level of patience to really get what you want out of things um, requires the ability to stop on your drives. Um, so the part that I want to kind of come back to a little bit as a question, which is a curious question from my part is based on, again, you're very focused on personnel, understanding your personnel, understanding your opponent's personnel. So when it comes to scouting report, are you more focused on personnel than you are on their plays? Oh yeah. Yeah. We're, we're first, we're, we're focused on who they are. Like who, who, who is that team? What do they do? Well, um, plays, you know, maybe a play here or there where, where like they have certain actions that, you know, the for teams, um, they like to come off a lot of down screens with shooters. You know, it's just as simple as any time a guard's underneath the goal, he's probably coming off something. Just make sure that you're aware. But we're not going to show you the play because our, our guys can't even remember our plays. I can't even remember our plays, let alone um, an, an opponent's plays. And so, I don't know, I, I think that's like – a lot of people, a lot of coaches will go over 45 plays of the other team and then they'll have all their calls. And it's like, can they really comprehend that? Is it just a waste of time? And, and I found that it is. So if you just stick with tendencies, um, specifically personnel tendencies or team tendencies and what makes them great uh, and kind of itemize that down a little bit, I think that helps from an offensive and defensive perspective. I think Coaches naturally like the feeling of, of thinking they're doing work um, by having all of the 50 sets that the other team does in their calls. And, and I think sometimes um, it masks maybe an inability to actually find what that team is really good at. Like, what do you hang your hat on? And what, what do we need to eliminate? And, and um, you know, those sort of things. And then per Per player, what do we need to eliminate with that player and, and what does he like to do? So, yeah, we keep ours very, I guess it would be subjective in, in that way and, and not X's and O's driven. Well, I knew the answer. And I, the reason I knew the answer is because in 180 podcasts, that is a characteristic of all the highly successful college coaches. Not, not all the coaches I've interviewed, but all the highly successful college coaches <laughs> focus on the personnel. And I just want coaches to connect that because it's such a powerful, powerful understanding. Absolutely, absolutely. Kids can comprehend that. And um, it, it, it's, it's, it's the beauty of, of like we talk about, it's, it's once you understand like the beauty of people and, and, and really get those people to, to kind of run your organization for you or run your program for you, I, I think you become pretty successful as a coach. And um, that's the same for, for an opponent. I think too often us as coaches think that what we do is more important than, than what it actually is. And, and with basketball, particularly, I think it's probably the most overcoached sport there is. And, and so I would prefer to have somebody say your team is, is undercoached. Um, like you said, with our offense, like I can't pick out necessarily what sets you're running. And and that's a great compliment. That means they're, they're taught. And, and that's what we want to have happen. Well, I want to get into the teaching part. And, and the part that I associate with overcoached is overcontrolled. And that's the other part that goes with that is often coaching means control. And clearly you're letting your players make the decisions and play, which is awesome. Uh, just sticking with that scout piece a little bit more, the question often becomes, how do you communicate that understanding to your players? I know you already use one term, which is dork. So do you give your players only a few things in terms of personnel to understand about an opponent? 
very few things. Yes, yes, very few things, and 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 um, less is more because you you can rattle off. You know, it's it's interesting when a when an assistant first does a scout and they're really trying to do a good job, even including myself when I first started. You'll list the hundred things that they do. So he likes to go right, but he can go left. When he goes right, he's not as good a shooter, but he does shoot it going right, you know, and, and it's like you want to say every single thing and you don't want to clean it up to two or three different things that they do. And so we really want to know our opponent so well that that we itemize it down. Yeah, we understand that he can also do this, but what, again, does he hang his hat on? Let's really concern ourselves with that. But you really have to have a great deal of knowledge to be able to do those sort of things and, and, and identify like what, what is it that makes that person tick? And um, we try to do that through a lot of, a lot of scouting. Mean, it takes a long time. So if you watch somebody for five minutes, that's great, but you're going to have to watch them a long time to be able to figure out exactly how to defend them. No doubt. No doubt. And I, I think what I'm trying to emphasize too, that you're saying is that you get beyond the obvious we don't need to tell players the obvious in scout, like they rebound. Well, yeah. obviously that's not going to influence anything differently by what we're going to do. We're still going to rebound defensively, right? So beyond yeah. that, beyond driver or shooter, what are some other things that you like players to understand about an opponent? Yeah, um, you know, how to take that away. And so how, how do I take away what they do well? So I've identified the problem. I guess the problem would be, um, he's an elite shooter. Okay. So, so that's the problem. Okay. So, you know, let's just use like a Steph Curry type, which we'd have no chance to guard him. I don't think anybody can, but whatever. So let's just use him, but <laughs> he's, you know, he's shooter first. And so then you try to identify where does this shot come from? You know, is it come from his right? Does it come from his left? Does it come from low? Does it come from high? And then what shots, like what direction does he like to go when he does shoot? Um, you know, like, does he like to go left? Does he like to go right? And, and then trying to, trying to eliminate his greatest strengths with that. So um, let's say he likes to go left, making sure that you consistently are on that left hand, sticking it so that his percentage goes down, you know, five to 7%. Um, and, 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 and understanding like now we've got the problem, he's a shooter, what's the solution and helping them understand the solution more so than the problem. Because I can watch I can watch a game and I can tell you if a guy can shoot or not. Like that's, anybody can, that doesn't know anything about basketball. I got it coach, that's the problem. He's a shooter, okay, we got that. Okay, so now my solution is, this is how we're gonna defend him and then being very deep, detailed with that solution. And so early on with coaches, they always wanna tell you all the problems. Coach, we don't have any energy right now. Okay, okay, I can see that. I got that. But let me see if you can come up with a solution for this problem. And that's the same for scouting personnel as well. Yeah, solution-based coaching. It's awesome. <laughs> awesome stuff. And uh, coach, um, I know, imagine this term is, is different in your opinion, and that's positionless. That based on strengths and you talking about your players loving their strength, I'm imagining that you don't really necessarily value positionless, even though your team looks positionless, you mm -hmm. want players in specific spots, don't you, to be able to take advantage of their strengths? Yes, kind of. Yes, um, absolutely. We, we want versatile. We want long. Um, we want guys that can shoot. Um, but if you can't shoot, we'll take you to because you probably have some type of strength that we absolutely love. And, and so yeah, uh, with Division Two, you can't be as personnel based, meaning like each year is going to be so different because I don't necessarily 100 percent pick the players that, that we want. Like I'm not going to go beat out Duke for um, a, a guard like it's just not going to happen. So um, some of it you get you have to take just quality players and then be able to fit them into the personnel. But yeah, positionless kind of. I mean. I've got two point guards Well, three now with a freshman, they're going to be the point guards. That's their position, no matter what. And then everybody else is a player. So, you know, if I want to play a point guard and four, what you'd call bigs, then I'll do that. And, and those are the four best players. Um, if, if my four best player, five best players are all point guards, then I'll play five point guards. And it's just, 
just how it works out. And so we don't get too hung up in that stuff. No, that's great. And uh, another thing I've got to ask is your philosophy on attacking switches, because that seems to be what I noticed a lot is a lot of teams, I don't want to say kind of give up in defending your stuff, but they kind of just default to switching a lot, it seems. So you got to be really prepared to attack switches. That's probably one of the easiest things now for us to attack. It used to be one of the most difficult things. And, and honestly, anybody that's starting off with, with ball screens or pick and pops or whatever, it's by far and away the most difficult thing to attack. And, and you know, part of it is what happens. The, the thing with switching that it does to a, a ball screen offense, either, whether continuity or random, is it, it, it can stagnate it. And that's the same for any offense. So if you switch a motion, all of a sudden they don't cut so hard. If you switch a play, all of a sudden, you know, they kind of get stuck and they stagnate. And then it becomes either an isolation situation where they overhandle or it becomes we're really trying to expose a mismatch inside and both stop your flow and both stop your offense. And so how do I maintain flow of an offense while I'm being switched? How do I keep the ball moving? How do I not just sit there and expose different mismatches through isolation situations is, is the really difficult part of, of handling switches and being able to attack them properly. So yeah, we, that's pretty much what we see is, is switching. I think we saw one team uh, in the final four that actually went flat on a lot of our ball screens. Um, we've seen a few teams that have gone ice and then ice and switch. Um, and then some teams just really don't do anything on them. So that that's, but, but switching is the, the main thing that we see. And obviously with Hutchkins, a uh, great point guard. I mean, his points per get possession, you know, in ISO situations is ridiculous. So clearly you're emphasizing a lot that, you know, you want him to be able to drive the matchup, but you guys also seem to bounce that with attacking some post matchups versus switches too. Again, it's what the defense gives them. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, like the national title game, they were very small. And so uh, we would go inside more. I, I can even remember, I believe it was Trevor. I think it was Trevor that I said at some point, I'm like, Hey, you're going to score at some point this game. And um, he said, coach, he said, look how small they are. I said, we're just going to go inside this game. <laughs> so he just went inside and, and um, you know, it puts pressure on the paint. And, and so how do you put pressure on the paint? You do it through driving, you do it through post touches and you do it through cutting and, and, those are your three best ways to be able to get paint consistently. So Zach Bovell, who uh, runs Pick and Pop, he's done an extensive study on you guys. So he gave me a heads up on this one. And I have to ask, he's now an assistant at Indiana State. So I'm not sure if this is something you work on, you have a term for it, but it seems like your players off the ball screen versus switches are really good at driving the gap, but not the gap towards where they're going. They're rejecting basically the switch and splitting the screener and that player that's switching out. So is that a drive back that you're emphasizing? Um, you know, when it originally happened, no, uh, it was just a complete accident. It's just what the, what the defense gave them. <laughs> Brilliant. And so, uh, Coach, we've got this down. It's so simple now. <laughs> yes. No, I know. It's so funny when people and coaches will ask me questions and stuff. And I'm like, they, they want, they want the rule. They want the, they want that. They, they really want the control of the X's and O's decision. And, and in reality, it's not that way. If you want to do it the way we do it, that, that's just what I always say. It's if, if you want to do it the way we do it, that's not how we prefer to run our offense. Um, so with that, it's, it's more just at that point, that's what was happening. And, and the defense essentially told them to, to do that. Um, um, not necessarily specific on, on what we're teaching per se. So once you identified players, that is a possibility um, to split it like that, uh, and essentially reject the switch. Is that something now that you're highlighting for players as possibilities? Yeah, if, if we see a strength, and that's how we've always come up with our, our, like our offense is like, we'll see a random, a random thing that happens throughout a possession. And we'll be like, oh, that was nice. I like that. Let's let's do that again. And then let's let's name it something. And then, you know, let's let's teach that, too. And, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And that's how we come up with them is literally through um, literally through 
group playing, you talked about um, some of our, uh, you call them Barclays, I call them Joey's because Joey Wittes did it a lot. You know, it's just, <laughs> so I just name things after just, players. Yeah. yeah. And so, so you just kind of call them something and, and, and I don't, I don't verbalize that to our players. I don't like come in with a bunch of verbiage. I, I think verbiage is completely overused. I always say, you know, it's like a, teaching a kid how to read. Um, a lot of like when you have kids, they'll, they'll teach them these vocabulary words, right? And then they'll say, okay, memorize all the definitions so that when you read, um, you know the definitions to these things. I would rather teach a person how to read initially and then they find those vocabulary words and then they're able to use those vocabulary words in a sentence and they understand the meaning of them but they can't actually define the word itself that's the same concept for basketball like you see a lot of these coaches especially the, the higher level you go they know the verbiage and they can define that verbiage for you but they can't actually use it in a game setting. They don't actually feel it and understand what it actually means. And so, you know, for us, that's that's kind of how it happens. It happens very organically um, throughout our throughout our deals where, okay, yeah, I really like that. You know, that really is really cool. So now we'll add that, but I don't want to necessarily add the verbiage to it because then it defines it too much. And then they're starting to think, what does coach want me to do? And and that's just not how we want to do things. Well, I love that analogy, coach. And I like this games approach or this coaching in the context of the game is so important and it's what you're doing. And I'm going to ask something about that. But the other part that goes with that is that what you're eliminating with your reading example is you're eliminating unnecessary progressions, things that waste time. And I find that's what basketball coaches often do is that we develop these perfect progressions, these perfect drills, but then they end up wasting the time where a player could just be put in a game situation and figure it out. And I'm imagining figuring it out is a big part of what you're teaching. I, yeah, that's, that's the biggest part of what we're teaching because every situation is different because once you get past one, two, three in your progression, okay, well, what if the team's good enough to take one, two, three away? And, and so now what do you do? And now the coach has the coach again and he has to come up with a solution and I want our players and we want our players to come up with that solution for themselves and, and, and think for themselves. It's funny when we get freshmen, it's, it's, you know, you get a lot of kids that really want to please because we got a lot of good kids and they want to please you. And it's like, okay, stop doing what I tell you to do. Just stop it. Like stop trying to figure out what I'm telling you to do and just do what you want to do within, you know, the, the, the framework of, of the offense and your strengths. And so you kind of break those chains a little bit and, and, um, and then they're able to like think a little bit more free of mind and then they itemize themselves back down into what they're great at. And it, it's a, it's an interesting progression and um, how I'd reteach it. I have no idea. Um, I, you know, you'd have to start a little bit back at square one, but um, where we're at right now, we're able to, to just teach it the way we do. Well, it's a difference in my phrasing. I call it the difference between musts and possibilities, absolutes and possibilities. And you've already referred to this when you talked earlier about the fact that early in learning for some of your new players or freshmen, there are maybe only a few possibilities, but then as they get better, they're going to have multiple possibilities or unlimited possibilities where you simply trust them, right? Yes. And then they make the decisions for themselves. And, and so when, like, if I come in and I'm running, let's just say first day I come in and I run 15 different plays, they've, they they play slow they play so slow and they can't play anymore. And it's like everything that they were good at is gone. And so now they've just become a simple robot and I can, you know, put anyone in that situation. So um, if we can kind of break that down and allow them the freedom of mind of, okay, so there are two things that we absolutely need to do. So if you're a big guy, um, we may say, just set as many ball screens as you can possibly set and then pop every time. Um, and so they'll be like, that's it. Yeah, just run around and set a ball screen and pop. And that's it. That's all you have to think about. And, and you don't have to overdo it. And, and so then they'll start to say, it's like, okay, so I'm popping. This didn't work. And they'll still, you can start to, start to see it like, okay, how can I make this work? And then they'll start to accidentally twist a few or they might ghost or they might slip or they might whatever. And, and, and then, you know, over time, they start to come up with those solutions on their own. And then they own it and, and then it becomes that much better and they can play that much faster and freer of mind. 
as that progresses, once they get a grip with that, then you can add a ton of precision. Like you can add a thousand different things and they can still play free of mind and not do what the coach tells them to do necessarily because they understand the concept of the play that we've just ran rather than just the play itself. And so they're able to adapt to any type of situation because they understand conceptually what we're doing. It's great stuff. And I, I mean, this as a compliment as well, coach, but I imagine your practices are somewhat boring to watch. And I mean that in the sense that I'm not going there and I'm writing down drills and plays, but for someone who appreciates teaching, I'm watching someone constantly teach within the context of the game, offense versus defense. And I say that again with respect, because I've heard that before about other practices, that that's not as exciting to watch sometimes, but it's what needs to be done. Yeah, so our, our, first, our first 45 minutes is probably our most exciting from a coaching perspective. So, um, you know, we, we, for 45 to an hour, we are getting after it defensively. Our transitions between drills are fantastic. Um, defense is a little bit more objective. You know, there's, there are more rules. There's more things that you want to make sure that you have to do. And so naturally I am kind of a defensive minded coach. And so, um, that's going to be the first part of practice every time. And that's, that's the thing that all the coaches really like is, is that part. And, and I get it. It's, it's tempoed, it's high energy. It's as fast as any practice you'll see. It's, it's a good, good practice. And then once we get past that, then a lot of times it'll be, you know, down back down, or we might do, you know, three, four or five minute scrimmages throughout all of our practice. And, and um, that's where we really grow and, and, and can get better. Um, the thing you won't see a lot in our practices is, is me stopping practice a ton and over talking. Um, we try to teach more with buzzwords. And then if we're gonna teach, we'll teach before practice or at the very end of practice. What I found is if you stop practice a lot and you do a lot of talking because you want to hear yourself talk, it kills the vibe of practice and it slows it way down. And, and we try not to do that very often. So um, it's, it's funny you say that, though, because I had a, a buddy um, um, went over to Spain to watch a, a team play. Uh, Jeff Linders is named Wyoming, and, and he... Uh, he, he got done and he, he sent me a couple of the clips of, of what they're doing. He said, ah, they play five on five. That's kind of what they do. And, you know, it's like, you know, me and him are one of the few that'll appreciate a five on five practice and, and really get something out of it and want to watch that stuff. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely, I guess, from a, you know, what drills do you do to teach cutting? I don't know, you know, just play, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what drills do you teach to do that? I don't know. It's just play. And so we try to do a lot of five on five to answer your question. Well, I appreciate it, coach, because I've gone through a whole season with just five on five. So I, I get it. I understand it and the value of that. And I'm glad you already talked about that a little bit about because that was my next question is about coaching interventions within game based play. So if there is something that you need to intervene and to highlight, then you're doing it with a stop and then a quick word and then it's going to continue from that spot. Or do you recreate the situation? What are you doing specifically when you teach in these game based moments? Good question. Um, I will, uh, I will stop and then I will do it visually. So it, it will be very visual and I will reset, I'll set up everything that just occurred. And a lot of it's transition defense or like a ball screen read. And I'll say, what do you see? See this, this, this. Okay. So what would have been the right option here? I don't answer the question for him. Because when you answer the question for them, it's like a lecture and they don't they don't understand it. I have them answer. They, they find the solution. And, you know, sometimes you have to guide them to that solution, but they find the solution. So let's just say it's a ball screen read on, a, on the top ball or whatever. And, and, and you know, the, the point guard doesn't see something. You know, let's see the, the defense is plugging and they don't see that. And so you kind of go back and it's like, OK, so why is this ball screen not working? It's like, well, I don't know, because it's just not working. There's no room on the floor. Okay, let's let's just stop. Everybody stand where they were where they were at and stand where they were at. It's like, okay, now what do you see? Okay, well, that guy's in, that guy's in, that guy's in, that guy's in. Okay, so so how can we create some space for you so that you can read the situation so it doesn't feel so compact? 
well, maybe we can cut this guy. Maybe I can kick to this guy real quick and drive him hard because they're in help. Or maybe I can uh, bring another guy up and, and set a double double ball screen so that it creates more space on the floor. Or maybe I can, and, and, and then they start to solution, they find the solutions rather than being overwhelmed by the problems. And you do it in that context so that they can, again, think for themselves, but it'll be very visual. It'll be less of a lecture style and it'll be more of an interactive solution um, solution. So educating coaches about this has been part of my task. And uh, since I moved into coach education, and I know one of the hard parts for new coaches to game-based coaching is that it's hard for them to shut up. So how, what have you done to train yourself to do that over time? Yeah, specifically in the games, you're saying? In game, in practice, even to your point about talking too much in practice. Oh, or over coaching. Much. Yeah, like yeah. this overcoaching is like we we can always as coaches, we're really good at knowing what the problem is. Sometimes we're not great at giving the solutions. And in your example, you are giving players the opportunity to discover the solution before you even give it to them. And that's really hard to do. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's a quote that's um, it's not what they it's not what you know, it's what players can comprehend. And so making sure that you know that 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 they can comprehend something, I think. Sometimes as coaches, we can get, you know, insecure with our knowledge. And so we want everybody to know how smart we are. And so then we overcorrect and overcoach simply so that we can tell everybody how much we know. And you have to kind of get, get past that. Because what I found, the more you know, the less information you'll, you'll give because you can really itemize it down because you have a great grip on the information. Um, the other part of that is, is trying to make sure that you don't bore them and understand some people learn a lot differently than others. Um, I was always the kid that was a good student, um, but if you went into, if I went into a class, a, a finance class, which was my major, and a teacher was talking the whole time and lecturing, I, I couldn't pay attention. Like I just wouldn't pay attention. And, and it wasn't for lack of trying, I would try. I just, my mind didn't work that way. And so I would, I would tune out and then I'd go home and I'd read the book and I'd figure out everything and I'd read through my notes. And that's how I would do my studying is I had to do everything on my own and figure it out. And so for me, it's always been a lot easier to teach because I was a very visual learner and I had to do everything and, and understand it and, and own it. And so if you're always offering solutions to your players and then you go off on these massive tangents throughout practice, um, they're not actually owning any of that. And, and so then you'll be able to identify, okay, so I've, I'm over teaching right now. Um, I need to make sure that I, um, I'm sorry, I'm over coaching right now. I need to make sure that I'm teaching Teaching is about making sure that they learn. If they're not learning and it doesn't carry over, that means you're teaching very poorly and you're coaching too much. And so understanding that will, okay, will trigger that. Okay, so these guys aren't doing what I tell them to do. If they're not doing what you, what you tell them to do, that is your fault as the coach. How do I teach them better? How do I, how do I reach them now? And, and then trying to reassess that will, will help you um, know when you're over coaching. Well, it speaks to that. We don't teach to our solution. We teach to their solution or allow them to have their solution. Uh, and that's such a big part of this game-based coaching, which I'm so glad you're highlighting. Uh, the other part that goes with that is just this, this process of connecting it to the game. I'm imagining your your game-based play is just literally a situation that you create and then they play from there. Um, during practice? During how practice. We a game situation. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have a lot of different scrimmages throughout practice and then it just naturally happens. We don't do situations. So a lot of teams will do late game situations, you know, side OB situations, baseline OB situations. They just happen in our scrimmages and and we just – they just happen and then you get to the game and every situation is a little bit different. So it's more like late game situations, more about handling the emotions, um, understanding what's actually important, like that really cool side OB that 
uh, Brad Stevens drew up the other day to get a shot, like that's not important. What's important was um, Marcus Smart getting an offensive rebound with two minutes to go, and then all of a sudden Jason Tatum hit a three because of that offensive rebound because he got his hand on the ball. That's important. The side OB is, that's unimportant. Um, it, you know, understanding what's actually important in late same situations really helps um, assess those. Give us, if you don't mind, just give us a quick perspective on what it means to scrimmage. Because I think some coaches, this is a misnomer. They don't quite understand what it means to scrimmage. Um, put five minutes on the clock, go five on five, tip the ball, and see who wins. Zero, zero, and see who wins. That's scrimmage. Everything's uh, are just game-based score, or are you adding different score. emphasis on score? Yeah. Game-based score. The only time we'll add emphasis is like a defensive drill we call passing game shell, which is just, um, you know, 4v4, and and it's still live. It's just, you know, maybe – Maybe that day we're making sure that we don't give up offensive rebounds. So maybe it's plus one if you get an overboard or, you know, something simple. But we don't overdo those things because because right when you do that, it's just an emphasis. They'll do it for that drill. So that might work for a day or two. But then over time, it, 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 it wears itself out. And so, yeah, one day send the emphasis. And then after that, now it's just normal scoring. Um, remembering that you did a drill with that emphasis and, and created that habit somewhat. So. No, we don't. Uh, you know, it's like it's like a lot of coaches and I will do if, if we have a team that's a little bit softer rebounding wise, we'll do the meat drills where you beat the heck out of each other and try to add toughness. Um, but for the most part, they'll always do it in the drill and then is the carryover there. And so figuring figuring that out and that goes to the teaching perspective of of helping kids understand why it's important to be physical, why those things are there and and et cetera, not just doing a drill and like, okay, check the box. We did that drill. Um, you know, it's really, does that drill impact us when we go 5v5? This incredible success that you've had, Coach, and you've already mentioned this a few times about process being so important. So I'm curious if you can just provide some insights for us as learners about how you develop a process-focused team. I, I think, one, I'm naturally very, very process-focused. I'm just I try to be very present in what I'm doing and I try to get a little bit better every single day, which is, which is very cliche, but if you constantly emphasize that and you are that way, a lot of times your team will naturally be that way. Cause there's no like magic pill that I can take today to make my team process focused because that's the point of being process focused is it's not result focused. So you can't just like, okay, today we're gonna be process focused. Well, that's a result, right? Um, that's a result of the daily focus on the process. And so um, for us, we, we, we focus on the process today to make sure that we're process focused, which would be essentially the result of the process. So kind of confusing there, but um, a couple of things that you can do. Uh, one in particular, I guess, we do it a lot in our preseason. So our preseason is extremely difficult with our conditioning. Well, when we go out in conditioning, I kind of make it up off the top of my head with our conditioning. And one, we never tell them what we're gonna do. Um, two, um, we never tell them when it's gonna end. And if we do tell them when it's gonna end, uh, it's always gonna end later than then, or it's gonna end earlier. And so what happens with, with conditioning a lot of times is kids will go kind of hard and then they're like, okay, I gotta really pace myself because it's gonna end here. And so what that is, is a future focus, like you're focusing on the end. To stay present and to stay process focused, I just have to get through the next sprint, literally the next step. And I have to stay right here because that'll allow me to get past this entire situation that I'm in right now. And so we really coach to that when we're in those situations of, of process and staying present and staying in like, okay, just make the next step. Like, this is really hard. I'm really tired. Uh, I, you know, I'm not sure if I can make it through it. I'm not sure how much longer we have. And then all of a sudden those thoughts overwhelm you and you become less processed, less present. And, and so we try to coach to that in the preseason and really keep them present in what they're doing. Oh, I love it, coach. I mean, I know you said you studied business, but it sounds like you studied psychology and the human condition, because that's really what shines through in this is, is not just the psychology, but also how to teach. And those two things can trump anything, can't they? 
I think I think in coaching that is by far and away the most important thing is just understanding how to teach, um, having your heart in the right place, really loving your kids, um, and, and having that process approach of of you know my my objective as a coach, and this is why I got into coaching is 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 to make kids successful once they leave here, to make a a big difference in their lives, and you do that through through basketball and teaching them basketball, teaching them to drive through goals, handle adversity, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, naturally, in order to do that, you have to essentially be a psychologist and, and try to make differences on their lives. Coach, on behalf of all the listeners and myself, thank you so much for uh, sharing the game with us. I mean, this has been tremendous and this is must listening for anyone that wants to learn about coaching. So thank you for sharing the game with us. Yes, sir. Thanks a lot for having me on.